Hello, this is Tyler Crone. We're the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted to invite and interview Chris Reichdahl, who is our Superintendent of Public Instruction, who is running for re-election. Over to you, Chris, to introduce yourself and welcome. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much to the 36th family. I'm Chris Reichdahl, the incumbent Democrat Superintendent of Public Instruction in the state of Washington. My roots are always important to me because it kind of defines why I do what I do. I'm the son of two people who dropped out after middle school. So they were really in a desperate situation. Uh, once they met, uh, they didn't have a lot of education and obviously uh, significant alcoholism. So the story of my family is the oldest six siblings spent two years in the foster care system. And then the state allowed them to reunite after my parents were sober. And my sister, April, seven and I'm eight. So I came along uh, in, in a pretty tough situation there, but it was public school that just it worked for me. I, I felt like I belonged. I felt like I was loved and I got supported there. So I've dedicated my whole life to this. Starting about fifth or sixth grade, I told my parents I was going to do it. Uh, no one in my family had ever gone straight to college. So I was first in my family to go to college and became a teacher, served on a school board, education foundation, 14 years in our community technical college system. Um, obviously in the legislature for three terms is you know what I consider one of the best progressive voting records in our state's history for those three terms. Tough times after the big housing crisis, we were closing corporate tax loopholes. We were finding progressive revenue and trying to keep public services open. So very, very pleased to be here. I'm grateful for this uh, opportunity with you all. And obviously we built an amazingly diverse team at OSPI that advanced a lot of investment, uh, meals for lots more kids, uh, inclusive practices that have been pretty remarkable. Um, we've obviously opened up pathways to graduation through CTE. Um, gosh, we got a million more kids reading books at birth to five right now. That We started that during the pandemic. So the innovation has been very, very impressive. And there's a ton of work to do, not the least of which we got to keep our public schools public. Uh, we've got two dozen states around the country now that have gone on to the voucherized system. They are driving taxpayer money into the hands of private operators, sometimes faith-based churches and for-profit corporations. And lest anyone thinks that can't happen here, the signature gathering was almost underway this year before uh, the state Republicans were stopped uh, by a ballot a challenge in a superior court. But I think they'll be back. And I think we have to have leadership that's experienced core to our democratic values that's going to fight against that. We're also a billion dollars down in funding, and we'll cover a little bit more of that. Thank you. Our first prepared question today will be asked by Laura Marie. Hi, uh, what is the role of OSPI in ensuring the state fulfills its obligation to fully fund education? And what have you done to advocate for this? And what new things will you be trying if you are reelected? Yeah, thank you. The word insuring is very powerful because we don't have the legal authority to ensure. The Supreme Court has tried to do that on three occasions in the state. Um, and obviously the legislature has a constitutional authority to write budgets and, and the governor signs budgets. So our job is actually to implement budgets um, it's to have fidelity with the policy direction of our leg legislators and then making sure that districts deploy at the local level with local board control, but against state standards. So as I describe it for folks at OSPI, we always build the blueprint. We're collecting all that performance data and figuring out what works and doesn't work. We're helping policymakers understand where they've come up significantly short, either against constitutional framework as set up by the court or where things have just changed. We just fundamentally needed different approaches to mental health. So we went back several years ago and said, even though you court lets you off the hook and you're fully funding, truth is we need a lot more counselors and nurses and mental health specialists and school psychs and got $400 million worth of those positions. Um, we needed to obviously open up pathways and open up CTE programming. We wanna make sure we feed 300,000 more kids, but we're close to universal meals. So our job is really to take all that education research. I have experts in every content area. I have a civil rights office. I have a massive meals office. These are folks who look at the research on child performance, child development, assessment, everything you can imagine we need to know about high performing schools. We collect that and then we build budget blueprints to say to the legislature, here's where we think you should make the next moves. Obviously in the legislature, I pushed for some, pushed for some very progressive revenue to get that started built one of the first McCleary budgets when they were struggling in 2017, 2018. And since then, we've come back each time with another way for them to make progress, either against that, that, that constitutional mandate or where we think that mandate still is insufficient. Uh, we brought additional expectation and, and some things we've had great progress on and others not, but it's really about coalition building. That's a major part of what we do, data collection, research and delivering the blueprint for the next investments. But at the end of the day, the legislature has to make the investments. Thank you so much. Our next question will be asked by Barbara. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Hey. Um, this is a long, uh, long question. Um, 
The rising trend of vitriolic language, violence, and discrimination against LGBTQ um, IA plus students across the country and in Washington state, what specific measures are you taking and will you take to ensure that all of these students have access to safe public education, um, yeah. particularly trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming students? Very powerful question. Uh, this journey for us isn't new. When we came into the organization, we always had a sense of the kind of gap closing we needed to do. And I think there are obvious places to close gaps. Students with disabilities, we've added a billion dollars. Um, race, where we've accelerated more kids to advanced programming. What was not on the radar so much when we came in six or seven years ago um, is gender inclusion, and particularly our trans youth, uh, both in gender identification and gender expression. So as you know, the legislature kind of dabbled in a little bit, and ultimately we said we need to pass a comprehensive sexual health ed bill. Embedded in that as part of it are uh, standards around uh, inclusive practices for trans youth and recognition of gender. So that was a baby step for us. First state in the country who had to go to the ballot on that, as you recall, and we defeated the right wing on this, which I'm very proud of. But that just kicked off a whole lot of things uh, for us. So we've got a bias in Title IX uh, reviews and investigations that we now do. We built a bigger civil rights office for this to hold school boards accountable and individuals. And most of them do a really nice job, but sometimes they don't. And so we built up that team to go in there. Um, you know about the sex ed standards. We now have gender inclusive guidance and we'll get another round of that soon with legislation that just passed. So we get very targeted and very technical legal and policy guidance to each school district so that they can maintain an expectation and a minimum standard against what we call laws to model policy. We have a, a separate agency that builds a model policy for districts and part of our job is to make sure that they're uh, adhering to that. Um, we put out guidance to protect trans youth with very specific strategies for school districts around athletics and bathrooms. We did it in 19, we did it in 2022, we just did it again in 2023. And so our whole goal is we're gonna elevate the profile of trans youth and protect them. You need the technical and legal framework and then you need to know that we are gonna come in and investigate if necessary. And mostly it's corrective action because they wanna do the right thing. And occasionally it's a lot more than that as some of you know. Um, and we're gonna get another big shot at this here soon. Um, because of the student or the parent uh, uh, rights bill that became uh, acted on in 2081, um, we get an opportunity here to really affirm that that thing did not tear down any student civil rights, both on the medical side or the education side. And so we're bringing a very big coalition together to affirm that on one side and state where parents clearly have rights because they do. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Our next question will be asked by Alex. Uh, hi there. Uh, how can OSPI improve the Title IX process and special education in Washington State? Yeah, special ed will start there really fast. Obviously, our big priority, one of mine coming in, was to close that gap. We put a billion dollars more in, We, but, but it's not just money. We've also done professional inclusionary practices. In other words, we spent over $30 million educating gen ed teachers on how to better support students with disabilities in their gen ed setting. So we've now hit the highest point in Washington's history of our students with disability getting 80% or more of their time in their general education setting. So lots less isolation, fewer resource rooms. So it's a combination of investing and the professional development and the high expectations for all students. But obviously we need to keep closing that gap because we have districts still using some levy money uh, in that work. The Title IX side again is where we're also doubling down the Betsy DeVos world, the Trump administration rolled back a ton of Title IX stuff. We did not go. So we knew that we were technically out of compliance with them, but our standard was so much higher. We knew they would get challenged along the way. Uh, quite frankly, we were never gonna come off of our protections on Title IX, which by the way is beyond sports, as you know, this is also about uh, discrimination in gender um, and or consequences, even if intent to discriminate isn't there. There's multiple frameworks to Title IX. So we held out and thank goodness, we've been pushing the Biden administration, the US Department of Ed, uh, to unwind all of that. They are doing that. And the new regs come back in in August. And it's very refreshing to lead in a state where the federal government is now coming back to where we already are at a very high standard. Thank you so much. Our last question, prepared question, will be asked by Don. Hi, thank you for answering these questions thus far. What do people not understand about the role of superintendent of public instruction that you would like them to know about? That it's the most distributed state in the country. And what I mean by that, if I, I'm with my peers and I'm on the executive council of a national association, I've got a national profile with states all across the country in this work uh, with my peers. 
Many of them are in states either where they're appointed by a governor or occasionally where they're elected, where the entire education portfolio is under them, early learning, K-12, and higher ed. They get significant ability to go direct uh, on policy. In our state, it has been intentionally distributed. So I have all manner of supervision, which means I distribute money, but only by formula. I collect data, but only by request of the legislature's framework. I have a civil rights investigation office, which we have been able to, to, to build. But essentially, teacher standards, different agency, high school credit requirements, different agency, career and tech ed, partly guided by a different agency. So when we have the success that we have had over the last seven years, it's because of relationship building and coalition building, because we really have to have multiple partners. And I don't always get it right. I will tell you that there are times I'm very aggressive and folks don't like that. And there are times uh, where folks are, are asking us to step into spaces and we get in there when we think we have the coalition to have success legislatively and on the executive side and community partners. It's why I'm so rooted in our party values. It means a ton to me because we don't get anything done without coalition. So to have endorsements from Congresswoman Jayapal in Strickland and 100 elected and former Democratic lawmakers, House, Senate, local government, I'm really proud this week to get the endorsement of Planned Parenthood, sole endorsement, Washington Conservation Action. Everything is connected to everything else in state government. And if you've been in the legislature, which I think is essential to serve in this role well, then you know that everything is connected to everything. And when you're pushing on something, it's somebody else's. That's that's a thing I'm not going to get. So you really have to build coalitions along the way. It's more important in this state than any other state in the country, I think. Thank you so much. That is the end of our prepared questions. We will have an opportunity for our e-board members to raise their hand and ask a follow-up with a one-minute response. I'll pause here and see if there are follow-up questions that folks wish to ask. And if not, I have I have one. So um, I see Laura Marie. Laura Marie. Hi. As I mentioned, I have four kids in public school and it is very important to me as it is to parents everywhere. And I'm wondering, what do you say to parents that want to have better options? And when people are asking for public funds for private school or charters or other options, how, how do you explain that to them? And um, how does it affect schools in general? And how does it affect uh, teachers unions and the rest of the students and everyone else when those public dollars leave the system? Yeah, the research seems pretty clear on this. We, we, we unfortunately have a lot of case now in the South and in the Midwest of the privatization movement. And what happens is you're resegregating schools all over those states. You're segregating them by race as people take their money. You're segregating them by income for sure because most of the vouchers are going to people who already have kids in private school and they're simply subsidizing the middle, upper middle class and wealthy. And I never thought I'd say this, but they're now resegregating all over the country by religion um, and, and denomination within religion. <laughs> there are growing Bible, growing numbers of Bible schools, uh, Baptist schools in the South where that'll only accept kids of that particular religious uh, expectation. And so I think any form of, 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 of resegregation is very, very troubling. I, I do want to be clear. Our money follows kids. If our student goes from Seattle Public Schools to Shoreline, the money goes with them. Um, if kids go into a career tech ed program at a skill center, the money goes with them. If they go to an ALE online program, the money goes with them. So we've been building choices and building options for students in this state for a very long time, and we've gotten even better at it since the pandemic. What I will always hold to, though, is those dollars need to be held accountable within a school with an elected school board that's where we can change leadership when necessary to say, if you won't offer an option, we're going to try to push you to offer options, art schools, tech schools, um, all of it. So including dual credit, running start college and high school AP. So let's keep building options within the democratic institution that is public ed. Let's not privatize the system because when you do that, you will never get it back. Thank you so much. Our next follow up is from Stephanie. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I, I have a, a kind of aligned question. Um, I also have two kids in the public school system. One of them is a, a highly capable tested, but is remaining in the general ed classrooms. I've also, you know, I think I share concerns about that segregation risk, but I'm also not sure that the schools are really doing enough to kind of teach to different levels within a classroom. And I'm curious if the state is, you know, what, what, what you're looking at now or what you will look like, look at in another term to help address those kinds of needs as well. 
Yeah, thank you. By the way, I share that same experience of two kids in public school, and one of them was pretty highly accelerated. And we really, it was important for us to keep him with his peers in school because there's a lot of research that doesn't get talked about in acceleration. That said, it's school choice. At the local level, they can accelerate kids, they can have standalone programs, or they can embed it in their classrooms. They do need to create multiple ways for kids to demonstrate that instead of a single standardized test. And, and since I've been in this office, we went from three and a half percent of kids in those accelerated programs to over 7%. And the fastest growing groups are students of color and low income students. So I love the progress. Um, I will say uh, it's challenging in places to differentiate instruction. It, it always is. You have 25 kids in a class and you're moving at different paces. I have a tremendous amount of hope that as we build out artificial intelligence software tools, they're getting very, very good. We're going to protect student privacy on the front end. But the ability for those algorithms to differentiate sounds and reading and pace of kids and fluency and then give customized report to the educator to say, these three students really need to work on this sound. These three students are really struggling with punctuation. The customization that's coming is going to be really powerful in differentiation. And we have districts testing that right now. Thank you so much, Chris. Dawn? Hi, um, I have some questions. One I would like to focus on right now is um, language, justice, and accessibility in public instruction. Um, I've been speaking to special needs and other um, enrichment education uh, teachers in the King County, and they have expressed that French is being cut and other language services are still being cut despite a 2022 bill passage for language accessibility. Um, and since we have increasing Amharic um, refugees that speak primarily French and East African diasporic languages, in addition to Spanish and Southeast Asian languages, um, what can be done to secure funding so that these students can receive culturally affirmative education? Yeah, thank you. That standard's in place now, thanks to legislation led by Democrats, for sure. Um, I would say that we have some districts that have such enormous challenges compared to their peers, right? Some of you are in communities with 50 languages, 100 languages or more spoken. So I know there's a combination of challenges from the money because it wasn't adequate enough when that was passed. And then there's the challenge of getting folks who can help translate materials. Um, so districts have a legal framework and obviously they're moving through the highest volume languages, but it is an enormous challenge. Uh, to get those materials documented and help families. So what we've pushed on is obviously trying to get our legislature to invest as, as part of a basic ed right. Students need access to that, as do parents. Uh, but then the other thing, as you know, is big priority for me is we also don't want to wait till the end of an education process. We want to engage families earlier. And part of the way you do that is you get kids in dual language programs very, very early on. Um, learning as five-year-olds multiple languages, and that builds out a community and a culture of expectation and language that helps later so that you're not trying to catch up in, in materials. Uh, you've got a cadre of young people learning languages. So we've gone beyond Spanish in the state, 150 schools, 50,000 kids learning dual language. If we're serious about multiculturalism and language, you don't wait till later on in life. You do it as early as you possibly can. Thank you so much, Chris. Our last follow-up will be from Alex. Alex? Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up on the Title IX issue since I know you mentioned um, Washington State's high standards. Um, that hasn't really been my experience with either like my with any of my clients. So I really wanted to follow up on this a little bit. Um, what has your office done or what will your office do to improve uh, the Title IX process as it relates to claims of discrimination within classrooms um, or the creation of, let's say, like safety plans within uh, schools and situations where students have been victims of violence within the school, like from another student. Um, a lot of schools, even in King County, refuse to even put on basic safety plans to protect their students when they've made disclosures to the school. So I want to know what your office has done to remedy this or what it will do in the future to address this issue. Yeah, what we've done is build out a team of investigators and civil rights officers. And so this always starts with a local case. As you know, it sounds like you have a lot of legal background in this. This is starting with a case out of a classroom or in a building. And there's a process that families and communities go through and advocates go through. We're close to that legal community uh, in, in a lot of cases. And ultimately, there is a step in which they can turn to us. We can handle a lot of this in terms of investigation, corrective action. Sometimes we have to partner with the attorney general's office if there's something significant there that's bigger than, than what our scope is. Um, I, I remind all of you, OSPI, despite having 43% of the state's budget and $17 billion in the complexity of the work, is 430 people across nutrition, transportation, finance, research, data, civil rights, all of it. So um, it, is, it is an agency that is uh, geared to 
mend people together and outsource a lot of work. As I talked about earlier, it is not the SCA of say in New York or in Illinois, that's a massive institution. Um, it really is meant to broker. So I, I feel very good about the civil rights team we've built. We've expanded it, the investigative authorities up. Um, and now what we're gonna do is spend a million and a half dollars of legislative appropriation to audit every single school district civil rights framework from Title IX all the way to their inclusionary practices. So we're gonna get a really good roadmap of who's got deficiency. And I think that'll help when we can get in there and get corrective action on those. Thank you so much, Chris. That ends the formal part of our interview with you. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I will wait till our recording is through.